Um, before we introduce our presenter tonight, I wanted to go over a few upcoming things for the Audubon. Uh, we have our October Birds and Brews this Thursday, and it's taking place at Echo in downtown Brattleboro from 5 to 7.30. Um, no RSV required, just stop on by. Um, and then we have our field trip to Dead Creek taking place on Sunday, November 7th. Um, we do need you to RSVP for that. If you're going to go, there is a link on our website, which I am going to put in the chat box right now. And it's sevtas.org. Um, and we're just going to do a day trip, go up, um, hopefully see the snow geese, um, see what else we can find around, around the refuge. In terms of either late migrants who haven't left yet or um, kind of arriving winter birds. And then our November program will be November 16th. Um, Caitlin McDonald, who is a PhD student at Dartmouth, will be presenting about um, tick ecology and kind of what the latest research tells us. Um, and as um, tick-borne illnesses are becoming more and more of a problem in the Northeast, that's a very topical and timely presentation. Um, and then the Christmas bird count um, is coming up. That will be Saturday, December 18th. And if you'd like to participate in that, there's a link on the website to sign up for that, or if you are a participant from the past and you know who your team leader is, you can communicate with them directly. Um, we have seven area teams that go out and survey uh, throughout the day and look for as many birds as they can find from sunup to sundown. And then we have some more folks who watch their bird feeders all day or even part of the day. Even if all you have is 15 minutes to look at your bird feeders, that still can be really valuable data about what's at your feeders. Um, so really encourage people to participate. Um, we're still working out some details for the potluck. Um, and we'll announce those as soon as we figured out what's going on with that. Um, and then I did want to provide an opportunity for folks who want to kind of share like what interesting birds are you seeing recently or other wildlife sightings have you had around the area. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and share or also you can put it in the chat box if you um, had any good bird sightings recently. May I speak? You may. Um, nothing really extraordinary, but uh, at the dam, uh, at the setbacks, uh, there were about a hundred crows on an immature bald eagle, mobbing an immature bald eagle. The two adults that were also there, you know, they they got the heck out of there with such, you know, an aplomb <laughs> and, you know, it was amazing. They were they were over almost over the horizon while this immature was, I suppose, still still trying to figure it out. And it was quite a quite a, a flock of of crows. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> um, there was a pied billed grebe at the Sursosmo setbacks this afternoon, and also a double crested cormorant, a juvenile. So waterfowl are still moving through the area. Anyone else? Have, oh, go ahead, Bob. I, I haven't seen very many um, waterfowl on the setbacks. Have you? The Sir Sassimo or Hinsdale? Uh, uh, Sir Sassimo. Um, No, there have been a few common mergs. Usually yeah. we get a, a raft of ringneck ducks, and they haven't right. yet. Okay. Or maybe aren't coming this year. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Sherry Corey posted in the chat box that on Sunday uh, saw about 40 ravens soaring and, and whirling around over the hill just behind Cumbies and West Brat at dusk. Um, last fall, I had a large raft of ravens up there that I had to do a double take because you don't expect to see ravens in numbers like that. I don't know what's going on. A few people have observed that it seems like we have a lot more ravens than we used to. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me, Corey? Yep. Um, we had a, a roost of 15 ravens here for three days last winter on our property, which borders the passing lane on Route 9 in Marlboro. So lots of, you know, roadkill potential. Right. Um, but it, I was going back over um, Bernd Heinrich's book on ravens in the winter. And um, back in the 80s, when he looked up you know, all the records he could find on raven roosts in New England, um, he found that they were, they were sporadic. Most of them didn't last longer than a week and they didn't, uh, the largest ones weren't more than 50 birds, unlike in Europe and in the West where they can be bigger. Um, so 
I, I think everybody, you know, crow roosts are a hot topic now. Um, everyone's out looking for crow roosts, but I think we should keep our eyes peeled for raven congregations too and, and try to start logging those in so we can build the record. It'd be fun. Yeah, very cool. Any other observations anyone wants to share? All right, we will go ahead and move on with the program. Um, Amy, I neglected to ask you how you pronounce your last name. Is it Alfieri? Yes. So Amy Alfieri with Vermont Fish and Wildlife is gonna be joining us tonight and sharing some information about uh, the Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area, which is one of the absolute gems for birding in Vermont. Hi, everyone. Um, the first thing I wanna do is apologize. I have a um, four month old puppy in the house who snores like a train and he's currently sleeping nearby and snoring. So if you hear him, um, it's not me, <laughs> it is the puppy. And um, I, yeah, <laughs> hopefully it won't be too much of a disruption. Um, I'm going to, I just have to get rid of this video screen. Here we go. Okay, so um, as Corey said, my name is Amy Alfieri and I'm a wildlife biologist for the state of Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. I am lucky enough to be stationed at Dead Creek um, because I manage Dead Creek and I am uh, responsible for all of the infrastructure that's there and uh, all of the wildlife that's there. And there, it's a, one of our more heavily managed WMAs in the state. So it really requires someone to be located um, at that site. Um, but to start off, I just wanted to mention um, what the mission of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife is. Um, and you can see it right there on your screen. And basically our mission is to conserve and protect um, all fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats. Um, I like to think of it for myself, not just for the people of Vermont, but also for their inherent values um, just uh, to uh, exist. Um, so, oh dear, now it's not advancing. <laughs> How did that happen, Corey? Uh, Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, the department is responsible uh, for conserving a multitude of, of natural features um, from anywhere from natural communities, uh, habitat for all the species that we protect, um, insects, plants, and we take that responsibility very seriously, especially when we think in regards to future generations. Um, so we serve public, um, I apologize, my computer is advancing slides <laughs> without me doing it. So um, I will try to stay on top of that. Uh, so we, we serve people of all backgrounds and all interests. Um, we work with landowners to help advise on um, their property and how to manage their property for wildlife. We work with anglers um, and people who enjoy watching wildlife. We work with towns and municipalities and of course, hunters and trappers. Uh, we are funded of, uh, in a variety of sources, but some of the ways that you or anyone can contribute is um, to, to our mission is the uh, purchase of a Vermont Habitat stamp, um, which is not like a stamp you put on an envelope. It's a sticker. Um, it's actually kind of a big sticker. And I put them on my water bottles and um, I've seen people put them on their canoes. I've seen them on cars. Um, and of course, the non-game wildlife fund is a tax, um, something you can check off on your tax return. So 
getting to the Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area, um, which is, of course, why we're all here uh, tonight. Um, I wanted to start by showing you this map. And this is most of the property boundary. It's not all of it. Um, there's one parcel that's further south. And if I had put that on the map, it would have made it really tiny and hard to see. Um, but this is the main section of the Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area. And it currently comprises 3,148 acres. Um, I, had, I have calculations of how much of that is land and how much of that is water. Um, and unfortunately it's in my notes, which are not visible on Zoom. So, <laughs> and I don't remember those exact numbers. Um, but if anybody would like those exact numbers, I can certainly get those to you. Uh, we owe a great deal of, of, our, of what Dead Creek looks like today to this man. Um, his name is Bob Fuller, and he, we consider him the father of Dead Creek. And it was really his vision um, as a biologist and, sci and um, scientist, basically. He, he was a classic scientist. Uh, and I know this because um, after he, he passed away several years ago, um, his, his three daughters donated all of his records to uh, Dead Creek. And so I have slides and all of his very finely handwritten detailed notes. Um, and it was a real treasure to receive that. Um, so Bob and others, I, I will say there were others involved in this, but Bob was really the, the, the father of, of um, designing all of this and designing the research. But he and others saw Dead Creek um, as a, it was a seasonal stream. And these pictures here show that this, what it was like um, before it was impounded. Um, for those of you who haven't been to Dead Creek, it has, there are uh, several dams that um, help retain water um, year round. And historically, Dead Creek would dry up in um, the summer and it would be inundated with water in, um, from seasonal runoff in spring. And this would never happen today, but back in the 1940s and 50s, uh, it was very common to impound um, something these these types of places to create habitat for waterfowl, um, and this was largely driven by um, the Pittman Robinson funds, which were and still continue to be um, a source of funding for uh, state fish and wildlife agencies. Um, it is a, an 11% excise tax on federal excise tax on firearms and ammunition that was started in the 1930s. Um, basically, there were some forward thinking uh, senators who recognized that a lot of species were in decline because of over harvesting and um, habitat loss, and they recognized the need to uh, conserve these um, wildlife and their habitats. And so they created this tax, um, which was largely uh, paid for by hunters who were purchasing firearms. So it was, a, it was sort of a, a way for the hunters to give back. And we still receive uh, quite a bit of funding from, from that grant. So construction started after we, um, Bob and others started working on uh, acquiring land. And they worked with more than 49 land over, private landowners, um, private individual landowners, and they made all kinds of deals. I've read through some of the deeds um, and there was one that kind of surprised me where uh, we were obligated to plant a hedge of um, multiflora rose, <laughs> which as you all may or may not know is a um, listed invasive species nowadays. 
Uh, I have never found that hedge anywhere, so I don't think it ever got planted, thankfully. Um, and uh, of course, we we added a lot of fences to keep cattle out of the uh, creek itself. Um, but largely, the work to create Dead Creek as we know it today was very intensive, um, as you can see from these pictures, which uh, were part of Bob Fuller's collection that uh, we received when he passed away. Um, these are all pictures of them doing this intensive work to create the impoundments. And it was long days, long nights, a lot of manpower, a lot of money went into um, these projects. And yes, even some explosives. <laughs> um, that was in part to break up the soils, um, which we have Addison County clay up here, which when dried out is like concrete. So I'm not surprised that they had to um, use some explosives for that. <laughs> Um, and today we have uh, 14 uh, sub impoundments, which are basically just smaller units, and we have three major impoundments. Um, and this map on the left here shows you um, the basically all of the impoundments that were created. Um, there might be a few that are create that were created a little bit later. Um, now, their intention, as I said, was to retain water. And as part of that, they uh, monitored a lot of water levels. They, you know, they were very systematic and uh, in, in their, in the work that they did. So what Bob Fuller started um, with before the, the impoundments were created was he did a, um, quite a bit of monitoring of vegetation and wildlife um, surveys to assess what these areas were like prior to they were, their impoundment. And then he continued those surveys after they were impounded to understand the response of plants and animals to the impounding. Um, so it was a fairly detailed process and um, it resulted in some pretty incredible uh, areas that attract a multitude of waterfowl. Um, we are actually looking, these pictures right here, um, the one on the bottom, actually they're both, but the one on the bottom is the better picture. That mountain in the background is Snake Mountain. And when, if, if you guys end up uh, coming to Dead Creek. This is the, um, it's looking west eastward towards Snake Mountain. And that little bridge right there is a rickety, it looks really scary um, right now because it's quite, it's 70 plus years old, but it is actually quite safe. And I have driven trucks over it many, many times. <laughs> um, so don't be afraid to drive your vehicle over it. Although I wouldn't recommend a school bus or anything like that. It's quite small, um, but it's kind of neat to see this picture uh, from the 1950s. And, um, and when you come to Dead Creek, you can see how it has changed or remains the same. One of the nice things about uh, Dead Creek that they, um, that was part of the, the research was that we um, have the ability to raise and lower the water levels. And um, they basically figured out, well, actually, I think I have slides later on about this, but they basically figured out that um, the water levels needed to be lowered uh, because the, um, the system was interrupted by these impoundments, basically, the natural system. So, by lowering the water levels, it mimicked a natural occurrence of, um, you know, what might happen in a natural setting. And I'll, I can talk a little bit more about that. One of the, probably the most unique things about Dead Creek, in my opinion, is, um, well, a couple things. There's a lot of unique things about Dead Creek, but um, Bob Fuller actually lived at Dead Creek, uh, there was a manager's residence and he, he um, 
his three girls were born in that house. And um, he, while living there, he, he did, he realized that there were a lot of Canada geese flying overhead, but not many of them were stopping, um, stopping over and using Dead Creek as an area for nesting um, or even during migration. And so he created an effort to attract migrant Canada geese to the area. And he went to um, Delaware Bay and captured, uh, I think it was 55 Canada geese, brought them back to Dead Creek. And um, basically they were a captive decoy flock. Um, so they were, they were flightless and um, they were kept in a 70 acre um, uh, enclosure, basically. <laughs> um, and the hand-drawn map on the right is a, a diagram of how they managed that um, 70 acres at the time. I don't have the exact year of when this was hand-drawn, but um, I think it's very interesting to see how they, uh, how they developed everything. Um, in that 70 acres. Now, the 70 acres was fully fenced in and the fence was, um, it was, <laughs> it was buried at least two feet into the ground. And um, there was this really dense um, gravel at the base of the, of the fence. And it was page wire or basically, you know, um, a three inch by three inch uh, fencing. And on top of that was uh, two strands of barbed wire and up and down the entire uh, height of the fence were three strands of electrified wire. And the entire 70 acres was electrified. Um, and apparently it was quite fiercely electrified. Um, and the whole purpose was not just to keep the geese in, although the geese didn't, you know, really try to get out through the fence, but it was to keep predators out. Um, and it worked. <laughs> and there was a large enough staff at the time to be able to walk around the fence and um, maintain it because it did have to be maintained and it had to be monitored to make sure there weren't any gaps. Um, because one fox or one coyote um, could do a lot of damage to that captive flock. So um, the captive flock actually was um, a little bit unsuccessful in reproduction to begin with, but they did start to attract uh, migrants that were coming through. And they would mate with some of these migrants and um, and eventually after six years or so, they finally produced their first um, gosling. Excuse me for a second. <clears throat> so the program continued until the 1970s um, <clears throat> when uh, the, um, the project didn't need to continue anymore because the population had of Canada geese had um, had pretty much expanded and made Dead Creek their home. <coughs> Bob Fuller continued um, his research and monitoring, which uh, involved uh, excuse me, I have a tickle in my throat, which is not a convenient time. <clears throat> so he continued his uh, research and monitoring um, throughout the extent of his uh, career as, a, as the manager of Dead Creek. Um, this included 600, oh, uh, a multitude of um, wood duck box um, management and monitoring. Um, they had, so sorry about this. <coughs> um, 
<clears throat> so Bob did, um, he had a number of grad students that he worked with who would go around and um, band, put leg bands on uh, waterfowl you, with the, who lived in these boxes. And they were basically monitoring the, um, the uh, responses of these, uh, these waterfowl, especially wood ducks, to um, the impoundments. This map on the right, I think, is very interesting. Um, and there, there are some questions that remain for me as far as what the, what the data indicates. But this is basically a hand-drawn map of band returns for a single, um, a single uh, wood duck. So you can see that there are a number of locations that where this um, wood duck was recorded all the way down the Atlantic Flyway. <clears throat> now you can see from these pictures that um, they used a variety of equipment, including pipes, <laughs> smoking pipes while they were uh, checking nest boxes and uh, climbing trees to check ne nest cavities. And of course, using um, a rather large telemetry antenna on a boat. <coughs> we still do this today. Um, we don't check tree cavities anymore, but we do uh, have 450 um, wood duck boxes um, that we maintain today. And we don't, <coughs> we're not allowed to smoke pipes anymore um, while we're doing this work. I, I love that picture. I just think it's very classic 1950s. And I'm happy to say that our antennas are quite a bit smaller than that today. <clears throat> I'm still here. Um, so in addition to um, uh, duck banding, we, the uh, department also in, was involved in Canada goose banding, which makes sense given that we had a captive flock. Um, however, the captive flock, once that was uh, discontinued, um, there was still an interest in monitoring the population. So they started in, um, started banding Canada geese rounding them up at Dead Creek and um, putting bands on them just with the staff in the 1970s. And, you know, the staff would bring their families and they uh, quickly realized how, um, how beneficial it was to have, you know, a variety of people there. So that quickly developed into I can get this to cooperate. Huh. There we go. Um, a public event. And today, the um, we host a public banding event, uh, goose banding event in July. Um, and of course, you can see the smiles on those children's faces. Um, we corral the geese. They are flightless at this time. And, um, and they're, so they're easy to catch. And uh, it's, it's a really great opportunity for us to talk about uh, why we banned um, birds and for people to interact with um, live animals in a, you know, live wildlife in a way that, you know, they don't normally get to do. Um, so this has been a very popular event for us. We also conduct duck banding um, in the fall. Uh, this is something that Bob Fuller um, also did, and we have continued this um, today. And uh, we have a number of locations up and down the Champlain Valley. Uh, and this is kind of an exciting thing for us to do because it does involve rockets. 
um, which sounds really dramatic, um, but it's 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 fun to watch, but it's not quite as it's not like rockets that um, you know go way up into the sky. Um, it's it's fairly benign compared to that. Um, and it has a low mortality rate, so it helps, um, you know, it's, it's an easy pro easy thing for us to do, and it's, it's relatively um, uh, safe for everyone, um, considering. And the most ducks we've caught under um, these nets are, uh, is close to 500 ducks. That's, that's a really high number. The average is 150 per per shot. We catch things from um, mallards, black ducks, wood ducks, those are the most common. Um, this year we actually trapped some uh, green wing teal um, and uh, occasionally we get some pintails, which I love. Those are amazing birds to have in your hand. Um, Part of the history of Dead Creek is, of course, the agriculture. Um, we are in the agricultural belt of, um, of Vermont. And uh, the agriculture was and is, continues to be very important for our, our management of, um, of uh, the waterfowl. And uh, back in the day, they used to just plant their own corn crops and um, other uh, species of food sources for the waterfowl, and they would use them for the captive flock, for the captive geese that they had. They would use the grains for um, to trap to uh, trap ducks, as you can see in the upper right hand corner, um, and the the birds that are. Uh, the ducks, the pintails, and the mallards that are in the bottom two photographs are part of the captive ducks that they had um, in the 1950s and 60s, which were part of, um, they weren't really part of a reproductive program. They were more part of a, um, of a uh, educational piece component. Um, Bob Fuller was very big on educating the public um, about what about wildlife and what they were doing at Dead Creek. Today we continue um, the agricultural process. Um, we work with area farmers uh, who lease the lands because we no longer have the capacity to um, do the farming ourselves. Um, so we lease our land out to the farmers and they leave um, crops for the birds. Um, we do plant, do our own plantings in some cases, but it, they're small areas that we can easily do. Um, and again, these crops are, are important um, to attract the migrant waterfowl that come to the area. And the picture in the middle is um, our buckwheat pond where we, we plant um, a variety of grains such as buckwheat and, um, and millet. Uh, and once it's grown in, we flood the area with water and the uh, geese and the ducks love it. Um, right now, I've seen, I've seen hundreds of ducks flying in and out of that. And that's in our refuge. So when you come to Dead Creek, you'll um, actually be able to see it from the viewing area. Uh, we also, within the refuge, um, we do quite a bit of, we've done quite a bit of uh, wetland restoration. So we consider the buckwheat pond as part of the wetland restoration that we do, but we've also done, um, worked with some partners on uh, doing another wetland restoration, which involves some ditch plugs um, and some pond creations as well. And at times we um, pump water into those. Um, and at other times, the uh, rainwater is all that's needed. Um, so we can just uh, put stop logs in control boxes to manage those water levels when needed. Uh, we also have areas that are just in grass and 
Um, we have some of them down as uh, delayed mowing. And we do get birds like boba lynx. I call them boba lynx. Everyone always laughs at me um, because I call them that. <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> That's just how I call them. Um, and I know there have been some uh, other species in, in the area and the uh, grass of grassland birds. Um, and the gentleman on the right is John Buck, who um, recently retired, but he was our uh, bird project leader. And he used to come down and do surveys of the grasslands looking for, um, he's, at, this is actually him in the refuge and you can see the viewing kiosk in the background there. I did briefly sort of allude to water level management, um, but this was Bob Fuller's, um, uh, one of Bob Fuller's discoveries um, in the 70s that, you know, wa water levels were, um, we needed to manage them. So that's when they actually started to uh, lower the water levels um, through using a, a schedule and um, just to see what would happen. And what they discovered is that there were, there was a seed bank in the mud at, under the water and the seed bank was uh, just full of, um, you know, wildlife friendly species that needed to grow. <laughs> and so they, when they lowered the water level, these, this seed bank would grow into this beautiful food sources for um, waterfowl. And so it was, it turned out to be a real success and it became quite evident that they needed to do this on a regular basis. And so today I have um, a 10 year plan that I, um, where I will lower water levels by 25% each year um, until it gets down to zero. Um, and then, and I have to rotate all the different units. So it's kind of a puzzle to, to figure out how to best do that. Because a lot of these um, impoundments are connected. So I can't lower the water levels in one section without lowering the water levels in the section that it's draining into. So it's kind of a fun little puzzle to figure out. So you can see on the left, some of the vegetation that's starting to grow. Um, and then on the right, this is once it's been reflooded. Um, it's, it's sort of important to reflood in the fall so that the waterfowl can access the food sources. Um, if we just leave it uh, without water, um, obviously, the birds will have a hard, more difficult time getting to that food, those food sources. One of the more exciting things that has come about lately is uh, in the past three years is we have a funding, a new funding source. And the funding source is um, through EP, the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and it's mitigation dollars for the loss of wetlands. And that has resulted in, um, well, basically the, the funds are supposed to go towards um, the uh, purchase of new lands that can be um, restored to uh, a, a wetland um, or wetland type settings. And, um, so when we purchase new lands, we are committed to doing, to converting at least 40% of that land into um, a wetland feature. And, um, you know, the remaining lands we can put into forest or do some agriculture. Um, you know, it's pretty creative um, or it's pretty open for um, what we're able to do. And we have a steering committee that helps to guide the, man, the, the plan for those parcels. And lately we have acquired two new parcels. Um, those, they're on the map here in yellow, which uh, is my ridiculous hand drawing. Um, the top one is about 130 acres and the bottom one is about 93 acres. And we acquired those in 2020 and so we still have some work to do because there's a lot of uh, regulatory loop, um, regulatory hoops that we have to jump through 
in order to be able to uh, do any earth moving, which is um, in, involved in restoring uh, lands to um, wetlands. But it's pretty exciting to have this new funding source and to be able to work with the area farmers who uh, many, the timing is right. Many farmers are um, going, unfortunately going out of business or trying to sell. They don't wanna farm anymore. Um, and so there's an opportunity for us to purchase some land and um, you know, be able to create new habitat while also keeping some of it open for agriculture, which is important in the agricultural belt of Addison, of um, the state. Um, we are neighbors with these farmers. We've had long-term relationships with them um, for over 70 years. So uh, we try to find ways to balance everything. Now, everyone I'm sure is wondering, snow geese, snow geese, what's up with the snow geese? Um, <clears throat> There weren't many snow geese when, when Dead Creek was first created. This uh, picture here is a captive, um, captive birds that were uh, part of the, the captive flock at Dead Creek. But um, they, again, they were more part of the educational, educational piece. The snow geese started to show up at Dead Creek in the 90s and maybe some of you um, came up here um, back then to uh, see the giant flocks of, of snow geese that were swirling in the skies. I know I did. Um, I remember parking on the side of Route 17 and uh, you know having semi trucks driving by really fast and there were hundreds of cars parked on the side of the road. And I just didn't care. I was so excited to see these birds swirling around. There at that time there were 20,000 plus uh, snow geese flying around, um, which is kind of a cool thing to imagine and, and to see. Um, today, we have significantly fewer birds. We average between three to 8,000. It really depends on the year. And that has nothing to do with their, uh, their, their overall population. It's not in decline by any means. In fact, it's quite the opposite. They are um, so abundant on their breeding grounds that uh, they are causing some major problems. And um, there are significant efforts in the flyways to help control um, these, the abundant, overabundant snow goose populations. Part of the reason for the snow geese uh, numbers declining at Dead Creek is changes in farming practices. Um, at Dead Creek, a lot of the um, Dead Creek and the surrounding farmland, I should clarify that, um, that uh, much of the farming has, um, is for uh, grain lynch, which is, you know, what they feed their cattle um, later in this. It's, it's basically it's dairy um, production. And the geese have, there, there's far less waste corn left in the field. The machinery is much more efficient. Um, so there's, there's just not as much waste corn that the snow geese can eat. Um, so they've moved westward uh, over toward New York, into New York, where um, a lot of the corn is raised for commodities. And for some reason, the equipment is a little less <laughs> efficient and there's a lot more waste corn. Um, and it's natural for uh, migrant populations to adjust their, um, their migratory patterns. Um, that's part of why we, we put bands on them and part of why we do radio telemetry studies so that we can track these, these shifts in their populations. But I will say that even with three to 8,000 birds swirling around in the sky, um, it's pretty awesome to see. It's it's definitely not the 20,000, <clears> but I think it's, in fact, I think right now we have about a thousand birds at Dead Creek and um, that's still amazing to see, especially when the there are gray, gray clouds in the sky. 
Um, and the birds are the striking white that stands out. Um, I will say that re this year I saw something I haven't seen before. I had stepped outside the visitor center at Dead Creek and um, I noticed that there was some, a quite a, a lot of birds, a lot of geese swirling around in the sky um, over the refuge. And um, I, thousands of birds, and I jumped in the, in the truck and drove down to the viewing area thinking, oh my gosh, the snow geese have arrived, I need to get a count. Um, and I get there and it wasn't snow geese, it was Canada geese. There were probably 6,000 of them. Um, and I haven't seen those numbers at Dead Creek in ever um, of Canada geese. Now, I've been told that before the snow geese started coming in the 90s, we used to get th that number of Canada geese and more. Um, but with the arrival of the snow geese, the Canada geese just don't want to hang out with them. They don't want to stick around. So they don't stick around as much um, or for as long. So uh, it's quite a different um, a different thing to see. And I was very excited by it. People don't seem to get quite as excited about Canada geese because they're um, much more common <laughs> nowadays. Um, but migrant Canada geese are just a thing to behold, in my opinion. So Dead Creek, while is, although it's known for its waterfowl, it is also a, an amazing place for a multitude of species. And I like to tell people that, um, I put all of these pictures in here because I have seen each and every one of these um, animals at, at Dead Creek, in particular in the 650 acre refuge, which is closed off to humans except for management purposes. So that's where we have, grow all of our, um, our corn and our, um, have all of our restorations. Um, and it is amazing to, to think about the diversity of species that we have seen, that I have seen, just me, one person has seen in, in, um, in that 650 acres. Another thing that I really enjoy about Dead Creek and in particular in my job, <laughs> I'm quite lucky to be able to experience um, this in the spring, all the, the wonders of rebirth and, and um, that includes all of these hatchings that I get to witness. And when we do our ducks, duck box maintenance, um, you know, we get to, we find, often find um, newly hatched uh, ducks in the boxes. And on occasion, we will find um, kestrels. Uh, although <laughs> these kestrels were actually in a kestrel box, I should say, so that, that doesn't count. But um, we find many other strange things in some of our boxes. Um, I just don't happen to have pictures. Um, sometimes we find water snakes and um, mink uh, like to go in there, obviously to feed on on the the, the ducks. But um, we try to prevent that with predator guards. Um, but I really I was so pleased to find this kestrel nest in the nest in the kestrel box. So I got a picture of them, all those little fuzzy guys. And of course, turtles, um, because we are prim uh, primarily a wetland-based um, WMA. Uh, we did have a, a turtle nest in, in uh, one of the areas and we were able to rescue them from, <coughs> from predation. They were close to hatching, so we gave them a hand. And guess what? We have even more hatchings. Um, <coughs> this was from a few years ago. We had a bumper crop of uh, monarch butterflies. And I need to have a drink again. <coughs> uh, 
And um, we took a few of them, as you can see, more than a few, and we added them to our visitor center display. And they um, turned into chrysalises, chrysalis, and then were uh, released as butterflies. We no longer do this because there's been new research that shows that um, caterpillars that are raised in captivity uh, lose their sense of direction. So we didn't want to want to continue that, um, or you know, we didn't want to influence that at all. So we <clears throat> stopped doing the captive um, or the uh, the um, chrysalis raising. Um, another feature of Dead Creek that people don't often think of is we, um, we try to promote pollinators um, where we can. In fact, recently I did an experimental two acre plot. Um, probably, I think we started it back in 2019 and um, it was a lot of work. We had to uh, burn, we did a controlled burn of the field and we um, then we tilled it and added lime to the field. And then we drilled the seeds. Oh, actually we spread the seeds. We just did, um, we had a seeder and just spread, spread all the seeds around. And then we had to wait a couple of years. And this was this past spring, um, when we started to see some real uh, progress um, with our pollinator fields. So we were, I, I was thrilled about this because the soils in Addison are, are clay, as I mentioned, and they're, you never know what's gonna grow there. <laughs> it can be pretty challenging. Now, hopefully, um, actually, I think if you guys are coming on in November, the first weekend of November, I really hope you'll stop at the Dead Creek Visitor Center. Um, this was Bob Fuller's house. <laughs> And after he left the department, he um, it continued to be the manager's residence up until I was hired. Um, part of the <clears throat> the job for me was to turn the the residence into a visitor center. So um, that's what I did, and um, we named the main entrance main room after Bob Fuller. Um, and we have a, a number of displays here. Um, I'd be curious if anybody knows what this little duck is that's flying out of the duck box. Um, feel free to put that in the comments if you can get a close look at it there. Um, I know what it is, but I'd be curious if anybody else does. Feel free to um, put that in the comments section. And, um, yeah, we have a number of displays about Dead Creek. There's a lot of materials for um, you to touch and read. Um, we have an emerging issues display. And um, I think this year it's about um, the indigenous cultures in, in Vermont. Um, and a lot of taxidermy and much of the taxidermy um, was uh, hit by cars, most of it was. So that's an interesting story to tell because it, it just emphasizes the impact that we as humans can have on um, wildlife. And we honor the warden ser service and um, there's uh, all kinds of information on hunting and fishing. And prior to COVID, we held uh, monthly um, events. Um, we haven't done that for a while, but we've had things like winter birding, um, herpetology, art in nature. Um, so a variety of programming that we hope we'll be able to continue um, sometime in the future. We uh, welcome school groups to the visitor center and to Dead Creek in general. Um, we haven't had many school groups because of uh, the pandemic, um, but it is a lot of fun when, when they do come and when we can welcome them. 
Last year was the first year in 20 years that we were unable to hold the Dead Creek Wildlife Day. Um, we brought it back this year and in spite of, or uh, despite some cloudy, I think the forecast for, uh, for the day was um, torrential rain, but we were lucky enough just to have uh, one tiny little rain shower in Addison while the rest of the uh, state was getting soaked. So I don't know why. I'm not exactly sure why we lucked out so much, but we did. And we had a great day. Um, we had about 350 people uh, come to the event. It's an entirely, um, well, this year it was an entirely outdoors event. Um, so it was relatively safe. And um, I think people were very happy to be, be there. Um, this year, we also brought back our bird banding week, um, which where we enjoy three days of bird banding with um, school groups. And um, we do, it's, it's mostly songbird banding with a little bit of, uh, we set some raptor traps as well, but um, we don't always have success in getting raptors. Um, and then usually there's a one night uh, owl banding to go along with that, a public owl banding event. Um, this year we just did three days of the school groups and no public, um, at, no public event, no public owl banding, um, which I think a lot of people were disappointed in, but it, it worked out uh, pretty well. One of the things that I'm super excited about, and you will see evidence of this if you go to the visitor center, um, is we have uh, designed and constructed an interpretive trail around the visitor center. It's maybe about a quarter of a mile long. It's not a, a very long trail, but it is and will be chock full of features um, that people can do in their own backyards. Um, such as uh, you know, planting um, bushes and trees that are bird friendly, um, pollinator habitat. Um, there's uh, some interesting, there will be some interesting, there is a hugel culture out there, which a lot of people don't think of as wildlife habitat, but it can actually provide really great habitat for, um, it for insects, you know, a lot, we often forget about insects, um, but not only insects, um, it can also, it, because they retain water and moisture, they um, are great for salamanders. So that's, that's a fantastic feature. And you can pretty much plant anything on a hugel culture. Um, so any native species, whether it's flowers or trees or shrubs, um, we have rock piles and um, a variety of other things. Now, the one thing to note is it is fall and we just planted <laughs> quite a bit of this. So it looks a little ugly right now, but boy, in another year and maybe a year and a half, it's gonna be one beautiful place, I gotta say. So I really hope people will come and um, experience it. Here are some pictures of the, the trail being constructed. The little circle is our outdoor classroom, which we will use for some of our events. And we held a, uh, a planting day. Um, and we had quite a few, all those boxes, we had over 3000 plants we had to plant. We still have some that we're, we're trying to get in the ground before freeze up. Um, but we had a great crew to help us. And um, we are working, currently working on creating interpretive signs. We don't have them in yet, but we will. <clears throat> One of the other things that I'm excited about is um, if any of you have ever been to Dead Creek before, um, there's a road called Gage Road, um, which is uh, a dirt road. It's a dead end road that goes basically to Dead Creek, goes to the refuge. Um, and uh, there are a surprising number of uh, bird species that are seen off of on Gage Road, anywhere from anything from kestrels, 
peregrines, um, northern harriers, uh, uh, grassland birds, um, uh, the snow geese are often seen down there, short-eared owls are, are frequent that area. Um, I've heard that there's a Swainson's hawk right now in, in that area. I have not seen it, um, but there have been a lot of people out looking for it. So uh, we've been trying to, at the end of this road is a barn that we've been trying to demolish for about 25 years. And we've run into some um, bureaucratic challenges <laughs> around that, but we have finally uh, breached those hurdles and I um, have a contractor lined up to demolish that barn. And um, in its place, my hope is to put a viewing tower, which people have been asking me about for years. Well, you know, when are you gonna put a viewing tower somewhere? And um, so hopefully by um, in the next year or year and a half, we will have a viewing tower at the end of Gage Road. Um, and I think that will be an excellent viewing opportunity for many, many um, species of birds. And the last thing I wanted to say this, well, this is a picture from um, last winter when we were out on the ice checking um, duck boxes and uh, or maintaining duck boxes. And we suspect it, it's an eagle, <clears throat> um, but it could be an owl of some kind, could be a snowy owl. Um, but that hammer gives you a kind of a perspective. But since I've mentioned bald eagles, the one thing I forgot to add to this program is the Bald Eagle Reintroduction Project, which was initiated in 2003 um, at Dead Creek. And when you get to the viewing area, you will see across the way nestled into the pines, um, a, an odd looking tower that seems to be falling apart. And it is falling apart, but 15, 16 years ago, it was home to um, some young bald eagles that we uh, worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service to um, retrieve from eagle nests. Um, believe it or not, there's actually a person who climbs these trees to get to eagle nests and take the nestlings out of the eagle nest or banned them or whatever the, their project is. And um, I think they're crazy to be climbing these giant trees, um, but everybody has their niche. <laughs> um, so we would get these uh, bald eagle chicks from a variety of locations in the Northeast where their populations were doing just fine. And we would take chicks from um, nests with three or four uh, chicks um, because they're more less likely to survive. Um, and we placed them in this hack tower is what it was called. And we would raise them in this hack tower with minimal human contact. And when they started to exhibit behavior where they might soon fledge, we would open the doors and then we would start the process of monitoring them from a blind until they did fledge. And um, we ended up uh, putting radio, to, radio tags on them, on five of them, and we monitored their movements um, for, a, for an, I think it was two years. And um, we were able to track how they moved across Dead Creek and around the area. And overall, we um, fledged 29 birds from that hack tower. And um, it's never been confirmed whether any of them um, successfully nested um, in Vermont. So it's hard to know for sure how the program contributed to the current boom in population, but um, many of you are probably aware that the bald eagle has been um, recommended to be removed from the state endangered species list, which is quite exciting. And I like to think that this program um, did help with that process. So um, with that, I wanted to end the program and welcome any questions. And if anybody has any guesses as to what that 
uh, little duckling was, feel free to let me know. We had a guess in the chat box. Somebody wondered if it was a hooded merganser. Oh my goodness, you guys are so good. <laughs> well done. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, many people just assume it's a wood duck, um, but it's not. In fact, we found it in a wood duck box and you know, we often find hooded mergansers, um, you know, we get them in, in duck boxes all the time. Um, so that's not unusual, but we brought it to the taxidermist to be, you know, a part of the visitor center. And um, we've brought it there thinking it was a wood duck. And when we picked it up, we looked at it again and we were like, wait a minute, <laughs> that's not a wood duck. So it's kind of a, a fun thing for the visitor center to, you know, quiz people. Yeah, if you have questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask. Um, Sherry Corey says, wood ducks and hoodies will raise each other's babies. Is that a question? I no, think. it's a comment. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I was the one who guessed that because I was very involved at the Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge in Concord, Mass. Yep. And, uh, and the hoodies were always laying their eggs in the Makes egg sense. Yeah. yeah. The wood ducks would raise the hoodie babies. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's fun to see. I have a, kind of I have thing. a management question in, in sure. terms of your interface with um, all of the farming community. Um, what kinds of issues, if any, have arisen in terms of contemporary uses of pesticides and herbicides and, and Roundup Ready crops and so forth? Yeah. I assume you, you must have certain restrictions, but I just wonder how you deal with that. Yeah, that's actually a really good question because we are we are sort of on, at a turning point right now where we are evaluating um, some of the farming practices um, on the land that we own. And, you know, we're surrounded by industrial farms that use all kinds of, you know, traditional um, equipment and traditional farming practices. And you know we have no no say on how that's done, but um, you know on our land where we really are at a turning point, we're at a crossroads where we're looking at um, trying to find a way to implement you know cover crops to prevent erosion, and um, you know the the herbicide question is you know, one of the things that I struggle with is that, you know, we, we plant these cover crops and then in order to get rid of them, they just spray them with herbicides and then plant their, their corn or whatever. So it's like, well, you know, which the lesser of two evils. Um, and so we're, I've been in discussions with the UVM extension and some folks from the ag department about some of the, the more modern approaches that we can take um, there is a piece of machinery, and I can't remember the name of it, that actually chops up the cover crops. So there's less need for the pesticides. And I don't, I just have to, my, my interface with the farmers has to be, um, you know, it's very nuanced because they are neighbors and because, you know, we've had relationships with them for so long. And um, we, the last thing, the last thing we want to do is create a, a you know, a less favorable um, relationship with them, especially as we're buying up farmland with the new EPA program. Um, so we really, it's a dance. <laughs> it's definitely a dance um, that just takes time to make significant changes. But we're we're definitely at a turning point. So good question. Um, just, just a little follow-up question about that. For the ones that lease the um, management area property, do you um, or do you do you have to follow any federal regulations or whatever in terms of restricting what they use um, in terms of herbicides and pesticides? A lot of them have to follow. No, well, they are using whatever whatever federal guidelines that they have. Um, so as far as like federal guidelines or federal, you know, they follow state guidelines. So we, we are obligated to follow state 
um, state program guidelines. And the federal guidelines they have to follow under their contracts with the um, USDA, the Natural Resources Conservation, no, Natural Soil Conservation Service, I think it's called. Um, so there's, they have oversight, they get oversight from, you know, the feds and um, as well as from us. So they have to have all of their stuff in line, um, even on our land where they're, where they're um, leasing from us. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Other questions for Amy? All right, well, I want to thank everybody for joining this evening. Oh, more I, questions? I, yes, I do. <laughs> this was actually the first one I wanted to ask. Amy, um, that, there's been a lot of work uh, lately, especially with Bridget Butler's coordination and mapping out um, uh, accessible birding areas. Mm -hmm. And um, I, and I, I'm thinking about it all the time because I have a 97 year old dad who loves to bird and photograph from the car. Yep. Um, and so it's very hard to get close enough to anything spectacular in that way. Um, but it looks, and I haven't been up to your area and I'm, I've been dying to go for, ever since we moved back to Vermont. So I, I'm just wondering um, how much of the road access to the area um, can put you, you know, right in a sight line to, to the birds so that that kind of birding is possible. It's, I would say, very accessible for um, car birding, birding from cars. Um, it's not like a lot of national wildlife refuges where they have this really- Yeah, right. you know, like foresight. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They have yeah. a lot more money than we do. Yeah. But, um, you know, between Gage Road and the viewing area and the, um, the road that goes along the eastern edge or the western edge of the refuge, um, there are plenty of areas to um, be able to look um, from the car. Yeah, that's great. And what about toilets? Um, the only the restrooms that are available are the ones in the visitor center, which mm -hmm. limited hours, um, but they're all ADA compliant. Okay, great. Thank you. And the trail is also um, ADA compliant. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the talk. This was really oh, interesting. Sure. Yeah, sure. really, really. I, I apologize for, I'm really frustrated that I lost my voice. That's all right. I have a chronic cough and when I give talks, it goes also. <laughs> so yeah. I, my sympathies. You can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, thank you so much for joining this evening and thank you, Amy, for the presentation. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really, um, I'm really grateful that you guys invited me and I welcome any follow-up questions. Um, Corey can, can pass along my email. And um, I do hope that many of you will, will come to Dead Creek at some point. And um, now you know the very unique history of the area. It's quite different. It's the only WMA like it in Vermont. So it's a special place. <clears throat> Great. Well, have a good night, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. Good night, everyone. Why do I stop recording?